<laughs> Hello, everybody, and good evening, and welcome to the Talkback slash Speakeasy as we get to enjoy the fruits of all the actors you see on the screen's labor and our director and our playwright. Eleanor, I want to start with you. You kind of get to sit in a lifeguard chair and you get to see the whole pool. This is your directorial debut, and it was fantastic. And by the way, Michael Seitao, your husband, did a great job uh, on the sound and the production. Like, it, it really, really, really worked. It was, you don't normally notice how good that is, but it was so good you noticed it. So, but your, your take on what it was like to sit atop the lifeguard chair and see all the different swimmers um, doing what they do and, and making this work. Well, I have a few takes, a couple of adjustments. First of all, in terms of all the swimmers, I thought it might be helpful for those sort of who've just heard it to kind of meet everyone, if we could just go around and say who we are and who we play, <laughs> since it's the faces to voices kind of scenario. Uh, and also, yes, hopefully my husband, Michael, will join us. He is putting uh, our littlest swimmer, Loretta, to bed, but, but uh, he was very helpful in terms of advisory, although he cannot take credit for the editing and the sort of soundscape. That also goes to Carol, Carol who is our um, MVP here. So that's mm -hmm. a lot of things at once. But before I give you my take, maybe if people just, I know you, you sort of spoke to us all, but if you just say your name and, and who you are, that might be a fun way to place us. So I'm Eleanor, and yes, this was my directorial debut, which is very exciting. Uh, Ella, I see you next, so why don't you go? Hi, I'm Ella. I play Lindsay. And Jeffrey? Uh, I'm Jeffrey. I play the accused rapist. Jack? Uh, I'm Jack Hanfora. I wrote the play and I play Ari. Played Ari. <laughs> That's it. He's done. Uh, Jill? <laughs> uh, I'm Jill and I play Anne. Carol? I'm Carol Todd. I play Emily and I did the sound design and editing. Yeah. And Laura? I'm Lauren. I played Rebecca. And then Melissa. Hi, I'm Melissa. I played Chloe. So why that's so exciting for me is that while this was my first time being trusted with the mantle of director, these people are, are sort of family we've worked together a lot we've acted together we've been in literal rooms together we've been on zoom together for the past couple of years so it was uh I really just felt like an audience member with privileges is how I, I sort of felt going in someone who got to ask questions before it got sent out for public consumption but I, I agree with everything you said John about the, the sort of the, the heaviness of it, the sort of, oh, how do you, how do you begin to swim in these waters? Uh, but the thing that struck me was family. That was the word that kept coming to me. I was like, this is actually a play about family. And that was my way in. And that, in, that includes uh, Jeffrey and Melissa's characters, right? And, and, and Melissa and Laura's sisterhood. These, this play to me was about families trying to keep it together under extraordinarily, uh, extreme circumstances but I and and so the sort of generational play that came into that and the um and the struggle and the, the ties that bind there I think was what made it really human and that's why you can you you want to hang with them and you you do uh you, you do oscillate between who's right here who oh, I, I'm drawn to you I'm I'm mad at you and that and that happens in family but but we still uh we still root for them and that's what i what i wanted but i think it came up if great and it, let me let me go to, to to carol uh emily is um emily's a hot mess and uh has so much <laughs> so much going on so smart and i i loved one of the notes i took in it was the the the, the family piece and the generation of women and um, you know you've got you've got Jill, the 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 power type A attorney who survived a ton of stuff that that is almost unspeakable, but but survived it with a with a tough attitude. And then there's there's Emily, the uh, middle yeah, generation yeah. poet uh, <laughs> writer um, who suffers from depression, uh, very real. Uh, and then there's there's you know Ella, the activist. Uh, the extreme activist, but but your character, Carol, is 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 exhausting. Um, 
And how did you, when you came into this thing, maintain that level of energy? I mean, everything from um, how you read the lines, but the, the, the moments where you cried, the moments where you gasped, the moments where you shrieked, um, how did you come into it and prepare for it and get yourself through it? Was it exhausting for you? <laughs> yes, uh, in a sense, because it was a, I had just started recovering from both mm -hmm. uh, COVID and being a little under the weather and having some tragedy in my family, so grieving. And so it was, I came into the day of recording ex extraordinarily exhausted and uh, which kind of in an odd way helped mm -hmm. as all of that inner <laughs> life of Emily's was kind of there for me to, to tap into without having to really think about it too much. And I was also very familiar with the play because Jack started doing readings of this. How many years ago was it, Jack? It was 2020, uh, right? Uh, where uh, Table Read, Chris Table Read, like two days yeah. before the And I city. think I read it before that. I think maybe a year before uh, that. Yeah, I showed it to you like the earliest iteration because I'd always had you in mind to play Emily, so. Um, yeah, so you. I think, he, I think he wrote it for me as a fiftieth birthday present. <laughs> Correct. There's one scene where you are done in your uh, DM conversation with um, with Rob, and you guys sort of hang up on your computers. You're typing at each other, yeah. and there's this that that shrieking gasp, and it was very powerful um, and mm -hmm. distressing. Um, Again, I think it's what 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 Jack intended, and, and you pulled it off. That was a little scary to do. That that came up organically in rehearsals, mm -hmm. especially the last rehearsal that we had before we went into the recording studio. And then you get into the recording studio, and it's a very different environment, right? Where where the mics are right here. Whereas I did, you know, when that that choice came up for me, we were in our own rooms on zoom together and so it was and we were also very used to that format mm -hmm. we worked on zoom together even when we were doing um sort of filmed versions of plays we all recorded from our own bedrooms or offices or wherever we had our setup so it, it was very comfortable it was very easy to to become intimate with each other and mm -hmm. to sort of tap into whatever we needed to tap into without too much pressure and then the recording studio, you know, the glaring light of day with these windows you'll see in our video that we'll be releasing next week, um, flooded with light and surrounded by technical equipment and having to be careful about not making too much noise in the chairs and the movements and everything because everything was being picked up by those mics. I got, I got a little freaked out and I'm like, well, I just gotta go for it and trust that even if it's not completely organic in the moment that I know where that lives in me mm -hmm. and that we did that and I, I can just do it and sort of, so no, it wasn't quite as organic in the studio as it was in the private rehearsal, but that doesn't mean it wasn't real, I guess, because we had already, we had already sort of sense memoried all those those moments. So it was just a matter of trusting it was there and reading it. And the, the script is so, this is how I usually feel about Jack's writing. It gives you everything you need. I don't really feel like I have to do too much acting with it. And maybe that's just if you sort of speak Jack's language. Jack has a very specific style and rhythm and, and way of expressing himself and his characters express themselves in very specific ways. So if that speaks to you, it's it's really easy to read his work. You don't really, I mean, and we did all the homework in rehearsal. Eleanor was great in in guiding us towards, you know, getting out of the habit, because we've done several readings of this play now, some of us, and, and she sort of guided us away from what might not serve us in this in this iteration and mm -hmm. what might expand it. And so we'd done it. And it was just a matter of then, sitting together in a room which we were so excited to be doing and and reading and to each other and it, it, once you took the pressure off yourself to sort of get it perfect it it was a really joyful experience i'm so glad and, and you you 
you just you just killed it. And um, I'll come back to you, um, Jill and Ella. I want to kind of get both you guys because I just am struck by the the, the contrast and and even probably more in in the personalities of your of your characters. Um, at the end of the play, uh, to me, Jill, the Anne character is is um, the master of 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 the gray area. Um, perspective, practical, realistic. Life's not fair. Um, and you're 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 contrasting that, or Jack has sort of contrasted that with with Ella, um, where Lindsay is. I mean, almost to the point where I, there's one point where Jack just screams. The Ari character just screams, and I was ready to do it too. Um, <laughs> the obstinate convictions of you know everything I know is right. Um, as you guys were acting this out together, did that did that was that obvious to you or 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 am i missing something here i'd love to kind of just as you guys related especially that last touching scene where it's just the two of you and 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 jill you're sort of explaining life to ella and is explaining life to Lindsay. talk about that a little bit and how you guys work together on that well we've we've worked together before um really intimately um and um so there's a lot of history for me and just hearing her Ella speak or seeing her face or you know I just get a lot from from all that and you know the it's the contrast between the two of them is very clear in the writing um but I also think that lawyers are trained to try to see both sides of the question and not not get so caught up in one side or the other and so i think that it it actually is quite makes a lot of sense that she um feels that way even though she feels that way for a lot of reasons that go back to her childhood etc but um you know i i think it's really well delineated jack's done a good job of that lawyer mind um and what that lawyer mind is like um versus the you know the passion and the um, the sort of one of the, the way of looking at things that don't won't allow for anything else, which I think um, Anne is kind of jealous of because she had it when she was young, and so I think there's a lot about about um, you know the relationship that has to do with Anne remembering herself at this point mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so i think that it's quite that's quite lovely i think that's a relief almost for the audience when you tell the story about the elevator and the tonsils and um it just it um it gives us all permission to to like the character even more because she becomes more real ella for you what was what was um i mean look i've got i've got college age kids I could really relate to to what I what I what I heard. I could relate almost to the point where it was driving me crazy. Um, <laughs> tell me, tell me, tell me what that was like for you and working yeah. with Jill and that, especially at that that toward the end there, as as it all kind of like it was a it was sort of a clash of 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 perspectives at the end there. I think I mean what Jill said. We're all so comfortable with each other that that sense of just like release and love and intimacy is so easy. And I think the thing that was harder was building up those walls around my mom, around Emily. And Eleanor said something really interesting, which was kind of Emily is such a mess and she's such a like, you know, leaking her emotions at all times that Lindsay is like repulsed by that and doesn't want to be that and just builds up that black and white thing around her in order to not be like her mom. Mm -hmm. And I think that she's always in contrast, really respected Anne. And I think the only person who could get through to her is Anne. And so to me in that moment, it's Anne being disappointed in her and Anne being like, even I, who am so strong that you do respect me, I'm having some trouble with what you're doing. I think it's like, it starts to introduce the gray into Lindsay's world in a way that I found really interesting as the end of the play. Like, I wanna see what happens next. I wanna see if she keeps going in that direction. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But yeah, it was, it was definitely interesting to be so, <laughs> strict and stringent for the vast majority of the play the end was more comfortable in a lot of ways so so, so what i love about jack's writing and, and and this is one thing i picked up um Lindsay is incredibly um 
the righteous. But she's also ambitious to a fault that almost undercuts how righteous she can be. And when, when Anne called Lindsay on leaking this to the press, it was, um, it was, it was, wow. Um, you know, there's the, the effort to be either black or white or right or wrong yet right there at the end of the play was, you know, you got a big fly yourself, Lindsay. Yeah. I was shocked by that when I read it the first time I had no idea. <clears throat> That's fun when Jack writes that stuff in, um, Jeff, I'm, Jeffrey, I'm coming to you in a second. Cause, cause I got to, you just, you blow me away and I, I'm, I'm nervous. Um, <laughs> well, so I'm coming to you right now. Um, <laughs> And here, here's why I, I want to come to you is I think, I think, um, is I was sort of like looking at the characters and under the, the definition of who's the victim. Obviously, Emily's maybe the biggest victim. But I also think Chloe is a victim. And Chloe is a victim for herself. She's lost her marriage. She's lost her husband um, through alcoholism and the AA program and he's recovering. But but what they had is, is probably lost. And then Maggie, right? And, and um, Maggie's a victim and, and Chloe's a victim for Maggie, I think. So I think there's two real victims that come out of the, of the cast here. Um, I also saw the character go back and forth between knowing exactly what to do and be, you know, lock them up and throw away the key to that huge mind change where I'm not gonna, I don't, I don't, for Maggie's sake, or even for your sake as the character, maybe maybe we can find some form of justice that's in the gray area. Maybe justice itself isn't black or white, it's in the gray area. What was your experience with all this? Is, did, did I get that right? So right, I really don't have anything to say. Um... <laughs> You'll think of something. I will. Um, uh, I, I do, I think that it was a really important and, and um, insightful to write a Chloe. You know, I think that you don't really think about the residual impact, the, the, the families of the bad guy. Uh, you don't really worry about what's happening to them. And there's almost this mm -hmm. assumption that, um, they should have known or they made bad decisions. And, and I think she was battling with that too. Like I've made, like I've, in letting this go so much of my life is a, is a supreme failure, failure. And so much of the uh, narrative that both I, and even more important, my daughter will uh, have to navigate is one tinged in this one moment. Um, and this one moment that so often, and you know, I'm, you know, I'm I'm a grown woman, and I know I've had conversations about rapists and what that means and who they are, and having to uh, reevaluate that from this particular lens was difficult and challenging. Um, but I was given a lot of fantastic language. I mean, I I know that we keep saying this and, and Jack is a, and he's in, he is, he's, in, he's incredibly humble about it. It's, it's almost unnerving, but I, it's, I'm not quite sure if writing is difficult for this guy. <laughs> Doesn't seem like it really. <laughs> you know, some of these conversations are just, you know, there, there were times very early on where, and, and part of, a lot of part of, my acting process is I, I try to uh, just say the words, you know, can we just start this and I'm just going to say them out loud and I'm just going to see where they hit me without putting anything on it. Mm -hmm. um, and I was able to carry that through for quite a bit of it. Just what, what are you about to say? And how, how can you, how can you let this come out of your mouth? <laughs> how does that go out of your mouth? Yeah. Yeah. But I look, I've read a lot of Jack's plays and I probably read more than I've heard, right? And I would say um, 
there is a difference when you when you read them because I think the way you put words and I don't remember exactly what they were but that you you know basically sell your soul to protect Maggie um and the level of emotion and as a parent you know you you get it right you would you would throw yourself in front of a truck to prevent a google search about your dad that comes out bad right and so so jack's words are there and they're great but it is it is like takes it to a whole new dimension when you're packing those words with emotion and um and I, that was a that was a powerful scene um I also, the Rebecca character, Laura, and you and I haven't met before, so um, most of the people here I, I, um, I got the chance to know. Um, and I remember, as I was listening to the podcast, I had a text chat, who's that? Um, and, and I, you know, you kind of came in, you, um, you know, you helicoptered in, and you sat there with your sister, and you guys really started to work through, like, you know, what are the options? Um, and as I said before, I was ping ponging, man. You guys, you guys. I was believing the last person who spoke, and I was like, "That's the way to go." No, that's the way to go. Um, uh, tell me, we're working with this crew. Is this is this one of your first times working with this group and this group of actors? And what was your what was your experience? And and what did you think of the the power of the 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 messages and the play and the themes? Well, it was my first experience working with New Normal Rep but not my first experience working with Melissa and Eleanor. We all went to grad school together. So mm -hmm. it was um, a return to home, which is, is just wonderful. And a real privilege to watch Eleanor work in that capacity as a director. Um, and then um, to work um, with all these amazing actors and um, speak these words and in this medium that I'm not as familiar with um, and learning how to tell this story in that way was, was also such a gift. Mm -hmm. I, what I appreciated so much about this scene with um, Chloe was just the sense of urgency that there, you know, I, Laura, <laughs> I'm always like, nuance is wonderful. Nuance is great. Like the gray is wonderful. But I think from Rebecca's perspective, like we don't have time for nuance. You know, like you, your life is falling apart and your daughter needs you. And, and you've got to get it. I was trying to get some, uh, <laughs> I think it must be JB yeah. iPhone 7. Like you you ordering Chinese food? Yeah. Yeah. I, think we, I think we can. Can you get me an egg roll? Yeah. <laughs> there are they muted. JB, JB iPhone 7 muted. Um. Yeah, no, I was just saying like the sense of urgency and I think um, the heartbreak to watch someone that you love and care about so deeply. Um, in the state that Chloe's in um, was difficult, but needing to just like get it together and and be a force to say like, okay, collect yourself and you know forge on because it's not just you. Um, I think your colloquy but, almost um, created. You were this role was really important to the play, in my opinion, because I would anything. Melissa does I'm going to believe especially when she's acting right I think Melissa's role needed to be challenged and and not just challenged like hey you might consider it was like you're out of your mind right and let's lock this guy up let's cancel him he deserves it and um, also you're losing your your daughter can't deal with you you can't deal with your daughter I mean, it was the reality, the dose of reality there. I think your big scene there was really important to sort of call Chloe on where she was going. Not that Chloe was wrong at anything that she said, but it needed to be challenged in the, in the, in the, in the play. I also think one thing you said too, um, you know, as, as kind of being around the periphery of New Normal Rep and, you know, kind of like listening with one ear sometimes and this whole idea of a podcast play. I mean, it wasn't until... I downloaded it, but I realized it wasn't a real play. It was like a 
like old, old time radio, um, which was new for me too. So I, I, it's fun that for me that as a listener, you guys were kind of going through that, um, the audio play thing as well, because um, I told Jack when, when I first listened to the first episode, it reminded me of my, my older brother and I, we grew up in Toronto, Canada. My older brother and I shared a room. And when I was five years old, I got a clock radio. And I remember asking my parents, will this radio have a uh, mystery theater? And every Saturday night, CBS would play mystery theater. My brother and I would lie on our bunks and it scared the crap out of me because it was always spooky. Mm-hmm. And, um, and this to me was like the first time I thought about mystery theater in 40 years. So um, I can relate to this new concept of podcast plays. Interesting medium. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, jump off on something that you said. It was really interesting to me, John. You mentioned how Laura is there to sort of check, um, or Rebecca, Laura's character, Rebecca, is there to check Chloe, uh, Melissa's character. And she was new in this la- latest draft of the play for, for this podcast drama. Uh, in earlier iterations, instead of Rebecca being there and them having that conversation, Chloe actually does what she tells Rebecca she's thinking of doing. And she goes to visit Emily. And it's so interesting because all of us reading the play, Jack got a lot of feedback from his actors and from other people that that was the one scene that we didn't quite buy. The the responses, it just didn't quite work for us. We, We each had a different kind of problem with it. And so he went back and he took a look at it and came up with this solution. And it it's almost like we we were a check on Jack's imagination. And then he created a check on Chloe because we were all like, well, I don't, you know, it, it's it, just a fascinating process to me that that's then what was created to sort of solve that issue. And you're right, because it, 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 to me, it was needed as a, as a listener. I think it well, was and a, something they can do as sisters and, and and Laura and I talked about sort of siblings and but I kept having this image of you just need to slap her you want to slap her and uh, with your language right and and you can do that as sisters you can you can say it and still be sisters and I think so there's nothing that needs to be careful in that moment and I and I think those are the two characters who aren't careful with each other. There's quite a bit of damage generationally in the and in the other family. And so there's a there's missteps, but there's sort of this carefulness that happens. Whereas these two, you can tell the love is so strong mm-hmm. that they buy themselves the 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 freedom to to just say it. And I think that's really um gorgeous to to watch mm-hmm. and look into, I should say, as an audience member. So yeah, I think that's right. The check is is immediate and urgent, as Laura describes. It's and it, and it's loving and and this moment of uh, it, of of just really strong love in the midst of all the turmoil. I think is is sort of a breath that we can take <laughs> with with them, which is nice. I agree, and Carol, I love that you shared the the collaboration process, and I, I'm sure Jack took you know the criticism really really well. And uh, oh, yeah. Yeah. We'll yeah. do another episode on that. <laughs> we were wrong at first, and then you know. Yeah. I mean, it, well, it, I mean, I'll, I'll just jump in and say that, um, you know, I literally, literally everyone said this doesn't work, and and I honestly didn't see it, but I also thought to myself, well, these are all really smart people, and you know, you know, like seven smart people saying you're wrong. Um, I'm not. I'd be crazy not to at least think maybe I'm wrong. <laughs> and uh, what I wanted to do, though, what I really it was important to me was to capture that impulse in Chloe. And I didn't want to lose that. And, um, and so I thought, OK, so, you know, how do I do that? And I didn't I didn't know. And I remember I think I called Carol one night and said, I think I figured it out. I think she needs a sister who who will who will stop her. But, you know, it goes to the everyone is saying very nice things about my writing, which is very nice until Carol pointed out that I screwed something up. Um, and uh, yeah, but, but the fact of the matter is a lot of this last like third of the play or last you know quarter of the play, certainly is very different. And I think it's much stronger than it was initially. And that's uh, as a direct consequence of, of collaborating with everyone of taking notes from, um, you know, Jill and, and uh, Eleanor and, and, and everyone really, and Carol and, um, so it really is, 
I mean, I'm not, I'm not trying to be falsely humble. I mean, I'm, I'm not saying I'm not proud of what I've done or I don't think I can do things well. Um, but it's, I mean, I think one of the things I, I do well is, is I'm smart enough to listen to smart people. And so, um, you know, if it's, and so it, it's a huge collaborative effort. It really is. And like, to your point earlier, you know, uh, John, yeah, that is what I wanted to, Carol to do at the end of that text exchange with, with Rob. It's exactly what I wanted the actor to do. I just had to write, she, you know, she weeps or she cries. Right. And I can, you know, and then I got to, you know, Coke and watch the ball game. You know, that's easy to do. You know, she, you know, Carol had to do it. And yeah. so it is, it's elevating, you know, when, when you get the right actors in there. And, and I think we did it, no matter how proud you are of a play on the page, uh, good actors are going to make it better. And so. Couldn't agree more. And I couldn't see, I couldn't imagine this play after been going through it all week um, with a different set of actors. I, I feel like you are all born for these roles that you, you, you're in. Um, and unfortunately, Jeffrey, I'm not saying you're born into the role of the rapist here, but- I was gonna say, but, except for Jeffrey, right? Yeah. <laughs> but uh, Jeffrey, the, I'm just gonna tell you the scene that jumped out at me the most, and then I'm, I'm gonna just ask you to respond to it and sort of talk about your experience in this play. You're in, you're in jail in Virginia. And um, you and Chloe are, are going at it. And you say, I need you, I need you, I need you to support me, something along those lines, right? And as the listener, I'm like, does he is he is he worthy? Does he deserve it? Um, can he even can he even ask for that? Is is it audacious for him to ask for that? Um, I'm going through my own process of like one of the things I said earlier, can you be canceled for one act if that's not who you are, but maybe it is who you are, but maybe it's not. Maybe it's just one moment in time that you screwed up and it was awful. But should you be canceled forever? Um, and that 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 exchange between between Chloe and and uh, Rob, where he just asked for support, was I mean maybe the language wasn't flowery and overwhelming, but man, the emotion that you guys packed into that thing got me thinking like, wow, does he really deserve it? Well, I think from his perspective, he does. Um, and I, I think when I think, you know, the, the play is called Step Nine, which is the step in the process of getting of healing in which you face the consequences of your actions. So the whole play is about really what happens when we face the consequences of our actions. There's two men in this play and they sort of are the flip side of the same. I mean, there's two, there are two versions of masculinity, one supportive helpful wanting to be there wanting to do the right thing and one toxic toxic to the point of self immolating through alcohol and uh you know i'm not going to i'm not going to go so far as to say that he's a victim but we do my our gender our the male gender is in trouble we've got to face up to the fact that that the way men have behaved traditionally is is bad, you know, and uh, and so I think that I think that the struggle with a character like Rob is to try and find your way into these fissures where you can you can justify needing to say a line like that, you know, um, and it be deeply felt and. You know, it's just it's just part of the nature of the character. You have to find a way to like the guy. Um, Jeffrey, how stick with this because I, I think I, I know you a little bit, not not real well, but I know you're I know you're a very progressive minded person, and and um, and some of the roles I've I've seen and heard you play are 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 bad guys. Yeah, I'm, that are that are rooted in that misogyny and are rooted in the 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 evil forces that you you just talked about a second ago how do you as a good guy get into those fissures and squeeze yourself into them so that you can pull something out of it that makes you very believable as a bad guy or a a sad guy in this right. case maybe mm. uh, or both right well i think i definitely think the theater is like really right now really not just theater but television as well is really trying to examine toxic masculinity because uh, I'm spending a lot of time playing these characters. 
Um, that's why I think that for one thing. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I remember, I think the first time I ever played an unlikable character, I was playing Hornbeck and Inherit the Wind as a character. He's like a newspaper guy in that play. It's very cynical, based on H.L. Mencken. And, and I, I remember really struggling with the fact that particularly those Houston audiences did not like me and I could feel it, you know, it was palpable. And, and at a certain point, you just have to get over the fact that people aren't going to like your character. You know, it's not about them liking you. In fact, if, if you're playing a character that's supposed to be unlikable and they like you, you have failed, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know, uh, and I have I worked with an actor one time who was playing an unlikable character and couldn't do it and he would he was masterful at always finding a way to ingratiate himself to the audience by getting a laugh mm -hmm. and he absolutely destroyed the character you know and he destroyed the moment of epiphany for the audience at the end of the play because because he didn't fulfill his function so I mean, you have to like, you have to find the things about the character that move you, that you can empathize with, that, you know, and that, that scene with Chloe is definitely one of them. I think he genuinely wants to repair his marriage. I think he genuinely wants to have a relationship with his daughter. I think he genuinely wants to um, uh, make amends for the mistakes he made. I don't think he wants to go to jail, mm -hmm. but you have to, you know, I mean, objectively, you have to go back and say, well, what, what, what should the consequences be for this action? You know, I mean, we have to answer that question. What is the reasonable reparation for this action? And uh, so I don't know, it's hard. You just have to, you just sort of have to, I mean, the character is, there's, the character exists in two ways in the play there's the real guy and then there's the guy that's in, in, inside carol's head mm -hmm. so and that is not really him mm -hmm. that's her imagine because she hasn't met she hasn't seen him in decades right so that guy is really more reflective of her character than him you know so i had to base it on i had to go off what those scenes were with melissa mm. fantastic of, yeah um by the I, way, just a little bit of, you know, behind the scenes insight, that prison scene, which is truly one of, like, it's just a gorgeous scene. Um, Melissa had just arrived and I think Carol had been working all day. Just for anyone who doesn't know, we, we recorded the whole thing in the span of, what was it, like nine hours or something mm -hmm. like that. And so we tried to stagger, but in there, invariably it's impossible to know exactly how long scenes will take. So by the time Melissa arrived, I was like, Carol must have a break. We were disobeying all union rules. I was like, get this, this woman a break. It's like, Melissa in, we're going to start you. You're start of your day. It is the prison scene. And they did it in one take, <laughs> one take. And I went, okay, beautiful. Okay. And Melissa was like, what? what, what are you talking about? Like that was just warming up. So if you've listened to it, that was, that was their first take. And it was. That's how the whole day felt in recording. It was so, every time we would finish a scene and Eleanor would be ready to move on, we'd be able to be, be like, wait, but that I, I was literally just warming up. I'm ready to do it now. <laughs> <laughs> but that I would do work. think that you know I was thinking about this earlier when we were talking about the fact that with the with the exception of Laura who you know it's just such a delight to have Laura Laura come into the group of people but all of us have been doing this together mm. uh reading plays together since March or April of 2020 so and we've read a lot of plays together and I think that that whether we're aware of it or not has in formed and 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 the, the way we work when we get together even when we get together in a room i just think you know we're able to get somewhere deeper than maybe even we realize we're able to get much more quickly because we've done it we've spent so much time together you know it goes that way it comes and across laura, that way and laura and melissa have that right, know, right. which is a, and eleanor with them yeah yeah it's an advantage of having a company, you know, it's a, it's a big totally is, yes. advantage of having a company.
Well, that's also the thing about being an actor is, I don't know if everyone feels this way, but a lot of actors feel this way that when we don't feel that like really, really intense connection to the material in a certain read through, we think, oh, that was crap. Mm. And then everybody around you is going, that was, that was it. We got it. And you're like, but, but I didn't feel it. Yeah. And that's not necessarily a, a real barometer of how it went. And uh, Jack, Jack, I'm going to come to you in a second, but I want to, I want to, uh, Carol, I want to play on that because I, I think um, Eleanor, Carol, any of you, when one of you thinks it's a wrap and the other thinks we're just getting started, I can do so much better on this. Does that happen? And what, what, um, are you guys like sisters that you can slap each other and say, let's, let's, um, just had to trust Eleanor. Yeah. I mean, that's what it came down to. And I've never trusted a director more in my life. Sorry to all the other directors out there I've worked with. But honestly, I mean, I'd be like, I don't think I got it. And she's like, you did. We've got it. I'm like, okay. <laughs> I guess. A lot of responsibility yeah, by yeah. Eleanor, who had always been our peer, we're now being like, tell us, we're, was it okay? Be like our eyes and ears and sanity. <laughs> My ears were so, I, I got so good at listening. It was real. And, and truly that was, even when we were Zoom rehearsing, I just would have my headphones on and sort of not look and just be like, just listen, just listen. This is, and so even, I'm, I'm glad it felt like... <laughs> That's it. But but there were plenty of times when we were like, just go back or oh, that's nice. Let, let's start again. Uh, so I never I never said let's move on for the sake of efficiency. It truly oh. was always nana or like and also I've sat I've I've been an actor for like hundred years. So I so I also know what that feeling is. And and so the, my barometer was would I would I be, if I, you know, if I was Carol listening back, would I, would I be happy? And actually, as it turned out, it was Carol listening back, doing all I'm these- I'm happy listening back. I'm proud of, of the piece, very proud, like maybe prouder than anything I've done. But in the moment of just having done it, I didn't feel like it was anything special, you know? And, and you can't know, you can't know. And there's just too many. It's, I mean, if you do watch the behind the scenes thing, you'll just see the sort of landscape we're in. It's a, it's very foreign. It's different from a film set. It's different from a rehearsal room. It's different from a theater with a set and like, so, uh, so what we had was with each other and chemistry and energy and, and the joy of exploding this in space together. And I think that that was the fun. It was sort of like when you hold, <laughs> I don't know the image. I'm going to mess up a sports metaphor, but something like sort of holding a, a racehorse back until, you know, we were rehearsing over Zoom and then you sort of let them go. That's what it felt like. It was like we've we've kind of been operating with harnesses on and then we we're in the room and I could just let let these people who know what they're doing do what they do. A, I do great, have to say, great, Carol, about, 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 about the day, the recording day, you, um, you seem to... You know, you weren't, you didn't feel like you were happy with stuff. You didn't feel like it was working. And having worked with you now for <laughs> eight years or something, I don't think I've ever seen you say, wow, did I nail that? <laughs> That's just not who you are. I hear you. I hear you. And I have had moments like that. <laughs> but then when I've done it two different ways and like I felt like I really nailed it on one, nine times out of 10, somebody's going to say, no, that one's better. Yeah. it's just a weird i think on that day carol you remember you were just getting over covid so i think a lot of it was you feeling like your instrument was limited right. in a way that it hadn't been normally so i think it just felt odd to you it yeah that was really a big part of it and let me tell you i went through all the footage that eleanor's husband michael taped that day video footage and listened to myself and i just wanted to <laughs> I'm like, just please just let it go, <laughs> you know, because it's hard to be sick and to, you know, and to yeah. have the pressure of this has to be, I, I, I really wanted this to be good. And it's, you just gotta do it. And luckily my character could, could be feeling crappy. Well, and here's the thing, though, I would say, and this is a, I mean, everyone I'm sure on this screen has worked with Austin Pendleton in, in some shape or form, because <laughs> that guy. but I, I did a show with Austin Pendleton 15 years ago and he, and he, I had a, t a terrible day and I came in, he was like, isn't the theatre great? Whatever happens in your day, 
you can just put it out there on the stage. And I, and, I, and so, so I hearing Carol say, oh, it's good that my character's going through it. It's like your character's all, no character walks on the stage going through nothing. <laughs> your day, you can put it out there. And I, and so I, you know, and look, that's the joy of, of kind of being a family uh, and, and going, okay, like, tr trust me. And the fact that, that you did is amazing. Yeah. Let me, let me steer things back a little bit toward uh, our playwright. Um, you know, Jack, my first, my first, is he asleep? Yeah. Oh, Jack, yeah. Jack, um, I, I heard my name and that's the first time I tuned in. Yeah. You know, but, um, yeah, I know <laughs> I, I texted you before to say, wake up. Um, <laughs> you are, um, writing about a rapist and a rape victim and step nine. Where does this even come together in your head what was the origin well i mean it's based <clears throat> um the the premise is is based on a real story um that i had that i had read about and um actually i think i'd heard about it on an interview with someone on npr and they um and i, I the premise just struck me as so um for lack, for lack of a less sensitive term fascinating um because it immediately called into question God, what would this in this poor woman's shoes? What what would she you know do? And I I don't know too much of. I, I deliberately didn't try and follow the story too deep down the rabbit hole because I I didn't want to do a donkey drama. I just wanted to take that premise and see how that would it would spin mm. out. And um, because it it automatically for me raised all those questions, right? Like you know how, what's what's justice you know look like in this case? You know he. You know, he reaches out. He, I think Jeffrey's right. He genuinely wants to make amends, but is he really doing it right? You know, that does that in should that matter? You know, yeah. it doesn't matter. You know, I think you know, the character of Ari says to um says to her, you know, uh, his ex-wife at one point, because she's saying, I really want, I really want him just to apologize and mean it. And and he says, and he says, Who cares what he thinks? Who cares what if he's sorry or not? You know, um, it's you. You have to figure out what you want and how you're feeling about things. And so, the story, and, and, and this, uh, you know, there's there's got a, there's a certain ruthlessness I think writers have to have mm -hmm. because, you know, as a, as a human being, I I started listening to the story and I thought, oh, this poor woman and this poor tragedy unfolding. And at the same time, I thought, wow, that's a great story, and I'm gonna, I am going to be. I'm going to use it, you know, and, you know, the story, um, a couple of the stories in the play, I mean, are really more than any other play I've written, I think, are, are taken from incidents that have happened either to me or to people I know. Um, and not, not in a literal sense, but um, the uh, notion of knowing what it's like to, you know, to be depressed or to grow up with an incredibly depressed parent Um or you know the the, the uh, monologue um, <clears throat> Jill delivers so well uh, about being in the hospital. That I know I know that, that happened to a person I know. Mm -hmm. So um, and so I mean, there's a sort you know I mean, <laughs> there's a sort of uh, one could argue ghoulishness about you know as a writer saying, well, I'm I'm going to have that you know I'm going to take that, um, but I think you have to be willing to do it because to me. The story was so um, it sort of it, it sort of got its own momentum, and I just sort of wanted to sort of see it through as best I could. And like I said earlier, they everyone here helped me see it through. But you know, the characters it sounds corny and 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 pretentious, but really it's true. When it's going right, really the characters are sort of telling you, you "Now here's where we're going to go next," and, and mm -hmm. this is what we're saying why, and um, and that's. An oversimplification, I mean, obviously, and you know, I go back and I edit and I rethink things, but yeah, I mean, so I just, it just, there's something about the story, and I, as I'm proving here, I think, can't articulate it. Um, uh, I just find it incredibly human and um, troubling and mm -hmm. affirming at the same time. And um, so there's something about it that just set me off in this direction. There's a lot in the play. I've known you maybe longer than anybody here. Um, yeah. And there's a lot 
that that was in the writing that came through that was very familiar to me hmm. knowing you right um yeah. Yeah. and and i think um you know, we, we both have college age kids that know they're absolutely right. Um, yeah. I think the, the, uh, the relationship between Ari and Emily, mm. um, you know, good, good friends post divorce, right. Um, you know, it's something you can draw personal experience from. Um, yep. so I think that really comes through, which, um, uh, those, not that it makes it easier, but, but when you have experienced it yourself, it may make it easier to write about it. Yeah, Jill said something to me in one of the last rehearsals, and I, I'm so dim sometimes because she she said uh, it was very very sweet of her, and she said that there you just really poured yourself into this, and like I, I really see everything you you've really given all of yourself into this play, and I dimly first thing I thought was well what a lovely thing to say, and then I thought is that true, and then I realized it is true, <laughs> you know um, there's um, you're right. I guess Ari is like me in some ways, but it's mm -hmm. but it's, there's also a lot of Emily in me as you know as mm -hmm. well. And um, so, what was, it, what was it like? The last time I saw you act was uh, Godspell, uh, yeah. 19, <laughs> 19, 89, 88. Is there a video? Um, what was it like acting? <laughs> it might <Yeah>. be. <laughs> um, it was it was intimidating and it was fun. Um, it was not my you know, it was not, it was not my intention to do it, but I think Carol suggested it and Eleanor said yes. And so I said, okay, I'll, I'll give it a try. Um, but, you know, these are really, you know, I, I haven't done it much and so I'm very rusty. And so my, you know, I'm looking at people playing at a very high level. And so I'm just trying to, you know, trying to return serve, you know, and um, in some ways acting my own stuff is much harder. Uh, in some ways it's much easier. It's much harder because it's harder for me to stay in the moment um because i'm very conscious as a writer well is this landing right or so it's very hard for me to sort of give back the most basic thing an actor owes another actor which is their full attention mm -hmm. uh, and it's easier for me because i i'm pretty sure i know exactly how i want the the playwright wanted me to say this line mm -hmm. so um you know but it was it was fascinating it was great fun i mean it's like great getting to uh, you know it's getting to not only act which is which i do love to do but haven't done much of but to do it with these like amazing pros and they're, mm -hmm. and they're, they're accepting me. They're saying, okay, you can, you can play with us for a little while. So that was, that was just a lot of fun. But that but, was it, Jeff. That was it. Yeah. <laughs> no more. I know. I know. Believe yeah. me. Don't push your luck. <laughs> hey, first thing you did was one take. Remember that? Yeah. 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 They humored you, Jack. Mm. Hey, Eleanor, I know we're at the top of the hour and, um, and it looks like somebody has a question here that I'll ask. I'll ask Eleanor just because Eleanor, it's you directed this whole puppy. I want to just give you the last word. Um, but can you can that comment flash up again? Oh yeah, let me let me start by reading that. It's not a question, but a comment. I think a podcast was a good format since the play is so rich in themes. So I I guess I actually did want to ask a question of those who have just listened. I love this play and I love this group of people. And I find myself not struggling to recommend it because I am recommending it, but, but I'm conscious mm -hmm. that when you sort of say, hey, come listen to our rape play, that's maybe not the sort of Christmas special <laughs> everyone's hoping for at this time of year. So yeah, I was hoping for those, for, so for Claudia and Don and maybe Cynthia, like I, I would love to hear a couple of, and, and, and John too, I would love to hear your reaction to it. So maybe an extension on your comment, uh, Claudia, about the fact that you felt it was a good format. I would love to hear what your experience of it was. For those so, who are listening on the recording, the full okay. comment is not a question, but a comment that I think a podcast was a good format since the play is so rich in its themes that it allows one to concentrate on the words. Thank you. I didn't realize that. Yes, we're accommodating that too. So yeah, I'm just curious to sort of um, give me my cell. <laughs> what was your experience, Claudia? I loved it. I thought I thought I thought it was wonderful, and I actually listened to it twice. Wow! And listening to it a second time, I heard things that I hadn't heard the first time. I, th I think it was just very rich. You know, all the themes that you talked about justice and family and relationships and just all kinds of things uh, 
in it. Um, I thought I thought it was exceptional, um, and the writing was exquisite. So right. and the acting was exquisite. Thank you so much. It's very well, very kind. Thank you and. I don't know that I can say it better. So I think I'll just end by by saying thank you to this this company of people. I I love that we've given a snapshot through this little behind the scenes documentary. Uh, it's about twenty four minutes of of a nine or ten hour day, eleven if you count the martinis afterwards. So uh, <laughs> uh, this was you can feel it, you can feel it through the Zoom, you can hopefully feel it as you listen to the episodes and uh, and you can feel it if you know this group. There's there's the the X factor that people talk about in the creative process, uh, I think is, is about chemistry and trust and family. And that plays out in the play, but it also plays out uh, with this creative group of people. So it's been my absolute honor to be trusted, not just with the last word, but, but with, this, uh, with this role. So thank you to Jack and thank you to this truly stacked cast of actors. Thank you. Thank you. It was quite a privilege to be your first production as a director. That's the honest truth. It, I can't wait to see what you do next. Mm. <laughs> Thanks everybody. Come back for more. John, thank you. Thank, Thank you. Happy holidays. Watch it. Watch the play. <laughs> <laughs> Listen to the play. Tell your friends. Listen to the play. Listen to the play. <laughs>